So the other day, as usual, I was reading stupid crap online, and I came across this particular piece of stupid crap, <sighs> this article, and because I saw it on the internet, you know it totally is completely legit and isn't being misrepresented in any way and is absolutely going to be something that comes to fruition. The point is, though, that the topic of the article really stepped on my snack a little bit. So I spent about half of a week reading, oh, I don't know, 50 to 100 articles on the subject tangentially related to said article, you know, like you do when you're a normal person. Anywho, it looks like the SPD, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, has put forward this proposal, proposal of the introduction of state-funded pornography. But hang on, friends, it's not just any pornography. No, of course it isn't. It's body-positive, intersectional, feminist pornography. According to the proposal, quote, Mainstream porn generally shows sexist and racial stereotypes in which consent is not a theme and certain optimal body types are made as standard. The SPD proposal further reads, In these films, sex seems more like a performance or competitive sport. Everything seems to work right away. There is no communication between the performers, no trying it out, failure to try new things out. I mean, I guess I can't disagree with that ending statement. <laughs> After all, I've heard similar words of wisdom from the sage mouth of this man. Men from jail, homeless, or a, <laughs> or a thug want to come move in. A Frankie moved too, man. You're Frankie Free moving rent, too. At least in the key. Fuck me. Piss on me. Beat me. I'm home now. You see me? You want to come over today and try it out? Try it out, man. Jeez. Not building? Try it out. You want to fuck a piss on me? Try it out. Jeez. You have to fight only as fuck, man. I'm looking for hardcore guys. I mean it. I want to do it. And I want to mm -hmm. deliver it. I'm a hot, fuck, white trash. Come, don't let's fuck. I mean, come on. You know, try it out. Try it out. I really think that those are words to live by. But okay, so the SPD, for those of us outside of Merkel land, is more or less the second largest party in Germany. Well, this kind of proposal, as I mentioned in the outset, pretty much carries no weight. It really percolated my peanuts and steeped them into a roiling heat. So now we can have a nice steaming hot cup of research on pornography. That's right, this is about to be an entire video on porn. First of all, let me be really clear, particularly for those who are so, so easily duped by claims to the contrary, I'm still a Lolbertarian, at least at heart. So my general opinion on any substance is, you know, you do you, boo. Do whatever you want, and so long as none of your filthy leaves, particularly that kind of leaf, don't happen to catch in the wind and land on my lawn, thus violating the non-aggression principle, at which point I am allowed to retaliate with a recreational tomahawk missile, I don't care what you do. The point is, yes, I don't care how many times a day anyone smokes weed or chokes the chicken, so long as it doesn't harm anyone else. And I wouldn't even include mental anger which such as surely was incurred from the thousands of people who have at this point seen DSP, for example, jerking his meat. I don't even think that's a violation of the NAP. The thing, though, that really irritated me initially about this was mostly the concept that the government would be paying for this feminist intersectional porn. And that means that the government is paying for a vice. It is subsidizing it. That essentially means that the government condones it. But moreover, potentially, it means that they are including, exposing young people to pornographic material potentially against their own volition. And I'm not making that part up, because according to the party's proposal further, Quote, even young people start too often with completely unrealistic ideas in their sexual life and do not have the opportunity to develop a self-confident relationship with their body, their sexuality, and health. It's about supplementing extracurricular education. Now, I don't speak as a Deutsch, so I had to run this through Google Translate, but I also have this article here from RT. So I guess I could be wrong, but the way that I would read this is that essentially the proposal is saying they want to produce educational pornography to be aimed at young people. 
This is supposed to be, again, state-funded porn aimed at the youth. What the fresh hell? Where do I even start with this? I don't have a general issue with pornography, and as I said, my initial concern here is one of a government frig off thing. But that doesn't even begin to address this whole child education aspect, or the general concept of really what effect does porn have on the psyche, if any. I think we need to answer that question if the government is going to be giving out pornography carte blanche. Usually anything that is funded by the government, or at least supported by it, has to go through a series of rigorous tests, at least in the Western world, to know that it is healthy and appropriate for public consumption. You can look at anything from medicine to media. Really, we generally have regulations in effect there. So if the government is to create pornography, that must mean that it's been highly studied. And guess what, friends? Yes, it has been, at least in the United States, going back about 35 years. So, uh, we have some research bases to go on here. But first, let's address the proposal itself. They suggest that porn is awful and terrible for women, that it hurts them socially or even personally because it depicts sexual relationships with women as violent or inappropriate and non-communicative. And as such, in order to mitigate and ameliorate this problem with pornography, we should um, create more pornography on the government paycheck just with different types of women and distribute it to young people in order to eradicate that? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well then, in order to respond to this again, if it's the government doing it, we need to understand porn, and we need to understand it in an intricate level of detail. So this is going to be a nightmarish info dump, but let's make a few things clear before we delve into some of that soft, velvety data. Like I said, I don't care about your porn usage, I don't care about your fetishes, I don't care what you do in your private bedroom with another consenting adult, but all that's being proposed here is really just creating essentially fetish porn on the German populace's penny. I mean, we already know the, the Germans are a bit well known for that. Are you thirsty? Huh? I want to breastfeed you here on these big nips. But, you know what else, interestingly, can make men more interested in fatties as this proposal suggests about the optimal body types? It's interesting, just stress them out a bit. Swami and Tovey 2012 found, for example, that after engaging in a 15 minute long stress test, men were more likely to rate women with higher BMIs as attractive. In other words, men who were a bit anxious, a bit stressed out, were more into them thick girls than men who are more calm and relaxed. Oh yeah, damn, damn boy, damn boy, he's thick, boy, that's a thick ass boy, damn, ba -ba! Those men, the calm ones, rated lower BMI women as the most attractive. I'm not really sure what that means, but hey, if you're tired of getting shut down by men because you can't stop shoveling food down your massive gullet, just find some way to stress a dude out and maybe he'll find your fat flaps a little bit more attractive. Oh, hot dog! Road cakes again! Heavy on the 30 weight, Mom! Don't! Don't eat with your hands, son! Use your entrenching tool. Oh shit, wait a minute. Was this the entire purpose of this fat acceptance movement garbage? Just make men so nervous and on edge that they become more attracted to your corpulence? Did you always have this divine knowledge? Anyway, it's not just the tubbos. The other goal of an initiative like this is to normalize non-heterosexual intercourse, which uh, Sweden has similarly already tried to do with this government-funded sex guide for maximum degeneracy. Again, the purpose of this is because heterosexual porn is supposed to be violent and terrible, and it creates negative opinions towards women and greater rape acceptance. Things that we will actually address because there are data there that are legitimate. But hang on a dick. What's this I found? Oh, it's a study that examined the similarities and differences in violence and aggressive behavior across the most popular homosexual and heterosexual porn. Is that what I just found? Oh, why, yes it is. It's Salmon and Diamond 2012, and what do you know? It turned out that there were no quantitative statistical differences in anything across both types of pornography that could be defined as violent or aggressive, with equal amounts across typical homo and heterosexual pornography, including penetrative sex, slapping, pinching, 
scratching, and engaging in coercive behavior to encourage sexual contact. Yeah, guys, get ready for the kind of video this is. These data might be a little bit too hot for YouTube. Maybe I need to make a Pornhub account to upload this bad boy. <laughs> The point is, mainstream homosexual porn is more or less identical in its average level of, quote, aggression as mainstream heterosexual porn. So if, as the SPD contends, typical heterosexual porn is violent and negative towards women, so is homosexual porn, meaning that creating and distributing more homosexual porn is not going to be any different from your average hetero porno. So it's already looking out the gate like this is really silly and just pointless. As I said above, I don't think it's going to matter because the SPD does not have the power to make this go through. But what we've discussed so far doesn't actually answer any questions about the effects of pornography on the psyche, on the body, on society. Now, just as with the satanic panic of the 80s and early 90s, wherein the religious right collectively rallied and railed against everything from horror films to video games to Dungeons and Dragons, all things I've personally enjoyed, I have always felt that the porn panic was similarly silly and misplaced. Oh man, it's Nazi Germany and I've got Playboys in my locker. I have stuff in my locker. Hannah Bain, Hello Boar, Mantry Group. Excuse me, Playboys, can we turn the sympathy this way? We know that media effects and exposure to media are generally small in their outcomes. So what's the problem with the government funding a personal habit if it's harmless, right? Well, again, as I mentioned above, the government doesn't fund any other personal habits. But I have to tell you, my friends, also, what follows are some of the most uncomfortable data I've actually seen, given what I've stated above. And in part of my literature review here, I also read several conversations between researchers during the late 80s and early 90s when much of this research was coming out, and they were debating whether or not porn should even be legal. And in light of some of the research that I read while I was conducting this, and although I definitively still fall into the, well, duh, of course it should be legal camp, do what you want so long as you cause no harm and all that, I started to see the argument at least a bit. And goddamn, do I hate in any way agreeing with the religious right. Did you not ask if she believed in God? She's not a Christian! She could be a Jew and believe it in God. It doesn't matter. She, she's tampering in doubt, sad and stuff. But let's look at the data. Zillman 1986 made an extensive report to the Surgeon General on the findings of the extant research at the time on the subject of exposure to pornography. Yes, obviously I get it. A 30-year-old report is, well, 30 years old. But this is where we're starting from because, first of all, Dr. Dolph Zillman pretty much invented media psychology. And secondly, because, as you will see, the findings have been more or less replicated in every subsequent meta-analysis and individual piece of research and study. So, as of Zillman's report, he made note of a couple extant pieces of research, starting with the old school, Howard et al., 1971. This is one of the earliest analyses of porn usage, and they asked college-aged males to consume pornography that was provided for them over 15 sessions and found that over time, while pornography continued to interest the male participants, they also generally and gradually became essentially desensitized or bored with the stimuli, including displaying lower general physiological responses in aspects such as heart rate and um, less pronounced penile response. And hang on to your wieners, lads, because I have a caveat about that that I'm about to bring up that extends yes, extends to several studies in this research. The interesting thing here, though, is that the participants continued to express enjoyment and desire to consume the media despite these physical reductions in response, what's called habituation. After eight weeks without exposure to pornographic material following the cessation of the exposure, some responsiveness approaching the levels of the initial arousal and physical reactions did return. Now, being such an early study, there's a lot to criticize here. They were kind of wandering around in the dark, right? The first being, though, that the study selected porn for the participants, and the number of pieces that were in their catalog was limited. So, no duh, it started to bore the men by showing them the same porn over and over. But more importantly, and something that we'll see a lot here in some of these early pieces of research to keep in mind, is that these experiments are all, well, experiments, and clinical in nature. 
That means that while they are the only kinds of studies that allow us to make true causal claims of X leading to Y, they also suffer by that same function from low external validity. That means that most wanking doesn't occur in a laboratory behind a one-way mirror with an apparatus attached to your penis to measure the strength of your erection. Just saying, it doesn't represent reality very well. God, this is a really hard video to record. <laughs> Let's move forward, though. Dr. Dolph Zillman, as I mentioned earlier, as well as Dr. Jennings Bryant, were heavily invested in porn around this time. <laughs> Fuck, as I said, this is hard to record. But much of the following was published in their initial research conducted in 1982 concerning pornography and violence. And then again published in their 1984 chapter in the book Pornography and Sexual Aggression. A book I'll bring up again soon in a moment, but one I highly recommend if this topic interests you. And while there are certainly <clears throat> other ways to obtain it, there are a couple of cheap used copies on Amazon. And Further though, the same data was also available and expanded upon in their report to the Surgeon General that I mentioned above. So the following report that I'm going to make to you guys is more or less a general overview of those three publications, as always cited below. Anyway, Zillman and Bryant's experiments included three conditions across six weeks, with two experimental conditions, one being intermediate exposure towards pornography at the level of three erotic films and three non-erotic films being shown per session, and then a massive exposure condition with six erotic films being shown per session, as well as a control condition that only watched non-erotica. The results found, without attaching any apparatus to the naughty bits of their male and female participants, that there was a similar boredom, dissatisfaction, and habituation effect such as what Howard et al. found. Much of the research on porn has predominantly been concerned with its potential to cause violence, particularly cause violence towards women, very similarly to what we've seen in the vast majority of research on video game exposure and television exposure. And while these kinds of questions do tend to dominate research, similar results such as these can be seen from various other chapters in that book I mentioned above and the subsequent mass of data that have been conducted over the last 30 odd years. Basically though, let me tell you the quick and dirty. Porn doesn't cause violence, but it does, shockingly, cause arousal. Much like video game exposure, much like exciting or violent television exposure. And as such, similarly to those other types of stimulating, arousing media, through the process of what Zillman calls excitation transfer, is often correlated to our measures of aggression. Now, our measures of aggression are often shitty. It's often things like, well, if you're feeling aggressive, you might make a louder sound in someone's ear. We can't actively measure violence or aggression. It's unethical. The point is, let me just sum up the 30 years of violence and pornography research right here. No not a direct correlation and definitely no direct causation between exposure to pornography and sexual violence or aggression. Anyway, I mentioned all that because Zillman and Bryant knew of this and thus specifically chose milk toast, run of the mill, non-violent, non-aggressive porn for their study of massive exposure. So, you know, they excluded all of the really sick shit like consensual sex in the missionary position for the purpose of procreation. Oh, wait, what? No, it was the opposite of that. Their findings again reflected Howard et al, with massive exposure being related to lower heart rate and lower systolic blood pressure. In contrast, those with intermediate exposure continued to be aroused by the exposures more normatively. In other words, everything in moderation, lads, which is probably the theme of these videos in the long run, but we'll get there. Zillman and Bryant's research, however, indicated more than just this habituation and boredom effect on the physical body in massive users but also several somewhat disturbing potential social and psychological effects. For example, massive users over time became more interested in viewing non-typical pornography, including sadomasochistic and bestiality content, than in the control and intermediate conditions. They also viewed these kinds of sexual behaviors as more normative in society. That is, the greater exposure to porn, the more interesting and simultaneously normalized alternative sexual behaviors were perceived. After the end of the six-week period of exposure, participants were asked to engage in a mock trial and pass a sentence upon a man accused of rape, 
those more heavily exposed to porn tended to give the rapist a lighter sentence. And while this is one of the few areas in this research that saw significant gender differences, with women generally supporting longer sentences for the rapist, unsurprisingly, the effect was still uniform across the sexes. That means both men and women who were exposed to excessive amounts of pornography let the rapist off with a lighter sentence. Further, more exposure reduced perceptions of erotic material as even being pornographic in nature, meaning that people who were exposed ceased to even be able to tell if something was porn. But perhaps most disturbingly, and related to a bit of our topic here today, more exposure forwarded greater acceptance of removing restrictions on allowing minors to access and view pornography, and outright broadcasting pornography to the public. And again, that's pretty much the topic here, right? Should the German government create feminist porn and distribute it to public citizens on the public citizen's dime, including by their own statement to young people for their education? Keep in mind as we proceed that greater exposure to porn reduces perceptions of pornography as negative for children, because it'll come into play far later. And I'll get to that question, but actually not even in this video. So let's move on with the basic effects from some of these early data. The point is though that we've seen extensive exposure to pornography can cause changes in both psychology and physiology, as well as social perceptions of norms. Zillman and Bryant, 1986, exposed male and female participants to pornography versus G-rated innocuous content in hourly sessions over the course of six weeks to further understand the longitudinal effects of excessive exposure and found even further changes in attitudes and potentially to behaviors. Across both men and women, as well as both students and non-students assessed in this analysis, long-term exposure to pornography was associated with greater acceptance of promiscuous behavior, non-monogamous behavior, generally more sexuality, lower perceptions of fidelity between partners, greater acceptance of extramarital affairs as normative, greater acceptance of non-exclusive partnerships or polygamy, and a heightened perception of potential negative health effects that may arise from sexual repression. Wow, that's a lot to take in there, guys. In other words, massive exposure to porn makes you incapable of controlling your horny level. Using the screen name B. Lindsay 01, he describes how he wants to give the girl oral sex. He says, I can't control my horny level. Then he says, I want to blank your brains out. I can't help it. At least in terms of attitude. But why should we care about any of these changes in attitude? Well, let's potentially talk about the declining U.S. birth rate in the years since the sexual liberation movement. First of all, yes, birth rates across the West are seemingly going down at large, including immigrants but they have stagnated across the native populace of the United States, all of its races and ethnicities, the most. We've also seen a long-term increase in divorce rates that began, well, around the period in which many of these data were collected. And although that has leveled out recently, we have to look at it in contrast, as the marriage rate remains on a downward trend, meaning less marriages, fewer divorces. And again, in contrast to that, we see that single motherhood from unwed women has skyrocketed. Particularly, it has skyrocketed across the black female population. Could this change in trends have something to do with pornography? Well, that's what this series is supposed to answer. First, going back in time to the time at which these studies were conducted, let's look at porn usage back in the 1980s. Bryant 1985 found that by age 15, 92% of boys and 84% of girls reported that they had been exposed to at least some form of softcore pornography, such as Playboy or Playgirl. By the age of 18, those numbers had raised to 100% exposure in males and 97% exposure in females. Similarly, and more recently, Sabina Wolock and Finkelhor, <laughs> 2008, in their analysis of digital pornography, found the percentages to remain more or less comparable, with 93% of males under the age of 18 and 62% of girls under the age of 18 reporting to have been exposed to online pornography. While exposure to erotic material before age 13 was uncommon across their sample, children did report having been occasionally introduced to deviant pornography, if you want to call it that. By that I mean rape, bestiality, and even child porn. Okay. 
So knowing that since the 80s though, pretty much every adult and most children over the age of 13 has been exposed to pornography, and keeping in mind the demographic shifts we've seen over the last 60 years or so, is it possible that porn plays a role? I think I'm gonna answer that later, but keep that in mind. For the time being, let's just look at the data. Zillman and Bryant 1986 further found that those exposed to pornography in the massive condition over the six-week period reported decreased endorsement of marriage as an essential aspect of society. Reduction went from 60% to 38.8% across all participants. Again, both male and female, student and non-student. Further, both men and women who watched excessive amounts of porn expressed lower desire for children. Dropping across the entire sample, in desire for children in general by 31%. But further, that desire for children dropped 61% when concerning the desire to have a female child. Particularly, this effect was most pronounced in women who considered their desire to have a daughter, which dropped to one third of its initial control rating variable in those who watched excessive amounts of porn. In other words, after watching porn, People didn't want to have kids anymore, they didn't want to get married, and particularly, they didn't want to have daughters. Finally, and something I'm probably going to restate about 10 times across this little mini-series, exposure to porn was associated with lower sexual satisfaction and reports of sexual happiness. But further, in a follow-up study, two weeks after the cessation of massive exposure to pornographic material, participants were invited back into the lab and allowed to select media to watch during their time there. You know, pick your pleasure. Those who had been exposed to the excessive pornography condition were more likely to select abnormal sexual material, including bestiality and sadomasochistic porn, rather than, you know, your typical run-of-the-mill shit. And that makes sense with the habituation effect, right? Eventually, over time, we get bored with pornography, so we seek out greater and different types of stimulation. Similarly, Bryant 1985, in his report to the Attorney General, found an alteration in moral perceptions to occur after prolonged and significant exposure to pornographic material. Over the course of five days in hour-long exposure sessions to erotic or non-erotic media, results forwarded that those in the erotic condition <laughs> expressed greater approval of sexual misconduct behaviors, such as selling sex for financial or social favors, or engaging in extramarital homosexual sex acts. However, this shift in morality did not apply or appear in non-sexual behaviors or perceptions of ethics. That being that participants had no change in their perceptions of the morality or immorality of acts such as robbery or other forms of criminal offense that were not associated with something sexual. So it seems that porn may actually change our perceptions of morality upon social behavior, but again, only as it relates to sexual morality. Zillman and Bryant 1988 further supported this concept by introducing participants of both sexes to pornography over lengthy sessions, similarly to above over six week periods and found that after this period, said participants reported no difference in their overall levels of happiness or life satisfaction. But they did report significant differences in their levels of sexual satisfaction, with lower levels of happiness concerning their partner's amount of physical affection, their partner's physical appearance, their partner's sexual performance, they also expressed general sexual curiosity at a greater degree and a higher general acceptance of the concept of sexual contact without an emotional connection, just a physical one. Similarly to the above, there was a lowered rating of the importance of family and fidelity. Thus, these data indicate that more porn usage further supports the notion of greater sexual deviance, less desires to engage in significant long-term monogamous partnerships, and further, lowered satisfaction in sexual partnerships and perceptions of consensual and conventional sexual relationships. Well, Aiden, you say? Or I say to myself in anticipation for the obvious critique, or at least it's a critique I found for it, but all of this research is decades old, right? Therefore, it has little to no bearing on modern society. Well, maybe you're right, friends, or me, whatever. 
So let's jump on our sexy TARDIS, I guess, and travel forward in time and see if we find similar results. We'll start by checking out this meta-analysis of 46 studies conducted between the years of 1962 and 1995 by Paolucci, Genius, and Violato. Hmm, apt name. 1997. On pornography and its effects, which included a sample of over 12,000 participants across these studies. Across the multiple analysis, the researchers found consistently that porn use was positively correlated to greater propensity for non-normative sexual behaviors. With between a 31 and 37% increase in what they defined as deviant sexual behavior, that being early age of first intercourse and or excessive or ritualistic masturbation, among others, in those who consumed porn. Similarly, greater porn use across the meta indicated between a 22 and 32% increase in the perpetuation of sexual violence. Again, this is a correlation. It does not mean that porn causes violence, but there is uh, maybe some correlational data there. Further, there was a reported 20 to 39% increase in negative perceptions of intimate partner relationships, with greater acceptance of dominant and submissive sexual partnerships, sex role stereotyping, meaning people should fit into this role or that, and viewing persons as sexual objects. Finally, the results forwarded a 31 to 35% increase in pornography users in acceptance of, quote, rape acceptance myths. Now, that's a term that gets thrown around a lot in a lot of research, but let me explain more or less what it is. It means that people generally think women were asking for it, but that's not how the data are usually collected. It's more like as above, would you give a rapist a greater sentence after this exposure? That's what rape myth acceptance generally is measured as. This is a meta-analysis again. But even with that taken into account, these data seem pretty damning, right? You guys understand I'm nearly wanting to pull my hair out at how negative this seems, at least on the face. And as I mentioned earlier, and before I go forward again, I should mention that in the 1986 to both the Surgeon and Attorney Generals, respectively, culminated in a conference in which a very lengthy discussion on the legality of porn was brought up. And while again, I in no way argue for the illegality of almost anything as long as it does no harm, I gotta say, I went and read the summit notes and even the leftist social scientists at the time struggled to defend pornography as good for society and the populace at large. But moving on while being as thorough as possible here, Alan de Aleso and Bresgel 1995 in a similar meta-analysis more or less agreed with the findings of Paolucci et al. and their assessment in their analysis of 30 works on the study of pornography with a consistent but relatively small effect of exposure being related to increased aggression at the correlational level of R equals 0.13. However, this effect of increased aggression, which as I've mentioned above is often poorly measured, was only present in purely pornographic exposure, not an exposure to non-pornographic nudity. In other words, don't worry too much about going into a rage and chimping out during your next trip to the local art museum. Interestingly, while this trend in aggression was higher in males, it was similarly found in women and across both violent and non-violent pornographic exposure. <laughs> in other words, creating and spreading non-violent consensual pornography, which you apparently already think doesn't exist as the SPD proposal seeks, probably isn't going to do shit about that aggression potential, at least that we have covered not only here with this particular meta-analysis, but above with Zillman and Bryant's work on non-aggressive pornography still having the exact same effects. But maybe there's something we're missing here. Maybe there's a major difference between the sexes. This is about feminist pornography, right? Again, it doesn't seem so. Jones and Barlow 1987, for example, examined porn use across men and women and found that the two sexes have very similar frequencies of sexual thoughts, but that men were twice as likely as women to report being aroused by external stimuli, such as erotica, as women, who tended to report being more stimulated by internal motivations and sexual fantasies. Hence, maybe why we do find some of these occasional differences across the sexes, albeit infrequent across the overall analyses between men and women in their exposure to pornography. But that is pretty much this. Men are simply more aroused by external stimuli, while women are more aroused by the internal. <laughs> Wowee. Interesting how it matches up to how we keep our dangly bits. 
But the point is, maybe we find some of these effects more strong in men because men are just more likely to utilize pornography. But moving on, Lambert, Nagash, Stillman, Olmsted, and Fincham, 2012, further dug deep into that little porn hole and assessed the various social effects of pornography across five unique studies. Study one found that while men were more likely to consume pornography than women, as I said above, not unexpected or out of line to what we've discussed, it also forwarded that those who consumed more had less interest in committing to a long-term partnership. Study two found that female coders, upon viewing a taped interaction between a male and female romantic partner dyad, that is, basically these women watched a girlfriend and a boyfriend interact, those viewers could more or less pick out and determine which partner reported more porn usage and reported also similarly being less committed to the relationship. What that all means is that people who watch a lot of porn express more non-committal, non-verbal behaviors from an externally observable perspective as confirmed by intercoder reliability, meaning that it was consistent across all of the people watching them. Yeah, that means that people can tell just by watching your body language that if you've been stroking the beef or flicking the bean too much based just on how you act around your partner. Study three asked participants to abstain from watching pornography and found that those who did remained unchanged over the course of the three week period in their commitment towards their partner. But those who did not abstain reported a decrease in a desire to commit to their romantic partner. Study four found that participants who used more pornography despite being in a romantic relationship were more likely to engage in flirtatious communication in an online pseudonymous interaction with a researcher confederate. In other words, they flirted more online, kind of when they thought they could get away with it, indicating an increase in potential for romantic alternatives from their current sexual partner. Finally, study five further forwarded that the use of more pornography across both sexes was related to lower commitment in general, greater potential for infidelity, and more potentiality for hooking up with non-committed casual relationships. Commitment was found to serve as a mediator variable in an indirect path between porn and hooking up, as well as porn and infidelity, indicating that if you feel particularly committed to your relationship, maybe you can look at porn and be saved from some of these potential negative effects but you have to feel particularly committed. Are we starting to maybe find an answer to some of these trends that I mentioned earlier, some of these demographic shifts? Of course, there is no way a single variable like pornography could be responsible for such a massive change in society. But it does seem from these data we've looked at so far, these huge studies, these meta-analyses, these reports to the US government, that high use of porn may in fact be a factor in changes in social trends. We've seen that porn is positively correlated to greater promiscuity, greater desire for more sexual partners, having more sex in general, feeling unhappy about the idea of marriage and children, greater desire to cheat or engage in extramarital affairs, and so on. So what might be the outcome from that, of all of that, from a more direct data stance, applying to society at large? Are the changes we've seen in attitudes, behaviors, physicality, potentially of serious detriment to society at large? This video is already getting too long for me to answer that question quite yet because that's a whole nother can of beans. So for the time being, tell me in the comments, what do you think? Is pornography potentially not just bad for an individual if they use it to excess, but is it bad for society at large and thus, in order to create government-funded pornography, is that an inherent misuse of government funding if not an actual act of the government distributing a potentially harmful substance onto its populace? Why might it be or not be? Again, wait for part two where I will try to provide some more answers. I think I've given some fairly strong hints as to where this may be going, but again, we're only halfway there. Tell me what you think, and if you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm Aiden Paladin, Altana Volt. Here's the deal. Try it out, try it out, man. Try it out, man. I'm just looking for some hot black guys that mean it and want to do it. Want to do it, want to do it. Because I'm a come dump. I hope you thugs come and try it out, man. Try it out, man. Try it out, man. Whether you're in jail or fucking homeless It doesn't matter cause I got a mental illness I got a mental illness, Tom 
If you wanna move